Welcome to another awesome episode of SoftRep Radio. I'm your host, Rad, and today I have a very special guest. But before I introduce him, I want to talk to you about our merch, our merch store, merch shop. Go check it out. It's at softrep.com. Check out our merchandise. We have branded equipment and, and shirts and things with our logo on it. And you guys have been supporting us so much. That's what keeps the fireplace flickering. So keep it up. We really appreciate you. I also want to mention softrep.com forward slash book hyphen club. You know it. And if you don't, it's book hyphen club at softrep.com. Go check out all the latest books that we've been curating for you to read and enjoy. And we're also going to try to get this next book, this next author in the book club. And without further ado, I want to welcome Staten Bonner, who authored Bare Knuckle. And this is his first book. And we're going to welcome you to Softrep. Welcome. Great to be here. Thanks for having me so much. You know, I have the book here. Bare Knuckle, Bobby Gunn, 73 and 0, undefeated, a dad, a dream, a fight like you've never seen. Stain Bonner, what a great feeling book. Okay, I've had a lot of books come through my hand, okay? And it, there's a feel. Do you know that? There's a feel to this book, and it just feels good. I'm glad to hear it. Okay. Felt good to me. So, yeah, it does. <laughs> it has a nice, nice feel to it. Some of them are slick. This one just feels like a little gritty. You know, it feels like where it comes from. You know, yeah. I box. Well, okay. All right. My business partner says the bag doesn't hit back to me all the time. <laughs> and I'm like, you're right. You're right. You're right. So I call a lot of fights. I sit around the ring. I have a microphone. I'll call you from the red corner, the blue corner. Yeah. You know, I love to do it. And when I was told that you want to come onto our show and talk about bare knuckle, I was like, ouch. Well, let's go. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Glad to be here. So, so you decided to go into the underground of the Russian boxing underground yeah. in New York City with uh, Gun over here, Bobby Gun. I'm just going to have to hold it up again. That dude has got a mug, bro. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, he's a tough guy. Literally no cartilage left in his nose. He'll give you the profile and compress it totally flat. Oh. Bare knuckle. I was so this morning. I was talking to my coach, Coach Demetrius, at my gym at Legends. I was yeah. like, "Hey, Coach, I'm going to go interview this guy about bare knuckle boxing." He's like, "Bro, that's the first thing he says." And he's pro. <laughs> he's pro. He's going. He's 28 years old, wanting it. And he's like, "All it takes is one, two punches with nothing, just to rip you open." Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's it's pretty fascinating. I mean, we'll get into the the science of it and the sport of it. It's completely different from boxing, uh, which is you know. Uh, more you know technical in some ways it's it's a longer lasting fight with boxing uh bare knuckles all about speed and precision you're trying to take down someone very quickly with surgical strikes uh but yeah you know to back it up bobby gunn to me was just a fascinating person um you know he was a father uh who was fighting in these underground mob backed bare knuckle uh matches to put his 7 year old daughter through private school um, that story alone stood out to me. And I was like, who is this guy? So I was working uh, as an editor in New York City at GQ magazine, writer there, and um, uh, saw a story on uh, in 2011 about the first sanctioned bare knuckle fight in U.S. history in 120 years happening uh, on a Native American reservation in Arizona because they were able to do it in tribal law outside of U.S. state jurisdiction. The the winner of that fight uh, was a guy, Bobby Gunn. And, you know, I was like, who is this guy? What is this thing? Uh, I looked him up on Facebook. He was right across the river in Hackensack, New Jersey. I messaged him. He's like, yeah, bro, come on over. Uh, so I went out uh, and went to this, you know, gym, Ike and Randy's. It's actually in Patterson, New Jersey, which this is not, you know, uh, your Bally's fitness. Uh, this was right. in a, uh, you know, pretty tough neighborhood. Uh, you had to go through a chain link fence past barking pit bulls, basically into this basement. Um, and it, it was a beautiful place, though. I mean, it was really all done with love. Uh, these guys in the neighborhood who were, you know, trying to, um, you know, improve themselves through sport and were really dedicated. A lot of great trainers, a lot of good young kids. Uh, but man, this was, you know, just sweat and blood. The place just like a sauna of sweat and met Bobby Gunn. Bobby Gunn was this hulking Goliath, um, you know, jeans, sneakers, 
uh, you know, cranking, just drinking a Dunkin' Donuts coffee, no water. <laughs> and this in like a, a black, uh, you know, T-shirt. And that's how he. That's what I was going to say. That's how, that's yeah, I felt how, it. Yeah, that, that's how he rolls. He's got his like cell phone holster on his belt. And it's just like because he just wakes up, dropped his daughter at school uh, to private school uh, before he goes doing asphalt work. He would hit this gym uh, and he had a son with him, too, because the son was working with him. And, um, you know, it was fascinating because he also had this tiny little dog named Max, little pit bull terrier uh, that he would take with him. Or, I'm sorry, French bulldog he had with him. And um, just the sweetest little dog. He'd put his little water bowl out for him by the, you know, by the uh, uh, boxing ring and, uh, you know, put him, give him some treats. And then this guy would step in the ring and just, you know, savagely go to town on other people. He, I saw him training in a World War I gas mask. And I was just like, who is this guy? He pops it off. It's like, hi, I'm Bobby Gunn. He was doing that to, uh, you know, simulate training at altitude basically so less oxygen uh yeah. but it was just an amazing introduction uh to this guy and, and i was instantly um fascinated it was what you were looking for he was what you were hoping he would he, you're like this is it this is who i want to write about and i'm going to follow you around and you did you you, you tailed him right yeah you know, like as a friend oh yeah so i spent years with him um you know so mm -hmm. again i was living and working in new york at GQ. Then I was at Rolling Stone as an editor. I spent years with him uh, going all over to fights. Uh, he was still a pro boxing. Uh, you know, he's still in pro boxing as well, a champion fighter. Uh, but really what was fascinating, what, what you see at these boxing gyms is um, there's really an underground uh, world to, to the fight world in both pro boxing mm -hmm. and MMA. Because at this gym, there was an old school phone sitting on a desk about the size of a toaster. And uh, it was a landline phone and there would be a little message board next to it. And if someone in the underground or you know, a lot of these were mob backed matches, whether it was Irish mob, Russian mob, uh, all these different factions, you know, it's like blood sports. I mean, just like dog fighting, right. cock fighting. Uh, they had this in Chinatown as well, where Bobby fought. And he was usually backed by the Irish mob is their guy. Hmm. To uh, basically, you know, fun nights out, uh, this would be the entertainment. <clears throat> and they would call and leave a message for him. Uh, you know, Bobby Gunn called this number. We have a fight for you. And that's how he would get word to uh, enter yeah, one of these fight. underground matches. But these these boxing uh, and gyms were a lot of times feeder systems as well. It was kind of this secret underground world that existed just below the surface. Uh, hey, you want some quick cash on the side? Uh, there's going to be a bare knuckle opportunity for you. And that's really, that's why Gunn did it, you know, for the money. And that's why a lot of other pro boxers and MMA fighters I spoke with did as well. What kind of money are we talking about here? I mean, I, I have an idea. I've read a little bit of the book, but what, tell, tell me, what kind of money are we talking about that he's willing to put his brain cells up against to put his kid through school, right? Because he's got a, he's got a job as asphalt. That's right. So he grew up paving, uh, left school at third grade, uh, and has been working night and day his whole life. Uh, and he does that um, all day. But yeah, when the pro boxing career fizzled and he started taking on these underground matches, it's all about cash and it's quick cash. You know, I mean, a lot of these guys have been burned by promoters, uh, different factions that run boxing, uh, gotten stiffed, gotten low balled. You know, he had, he had fought as a trainer for Carl King, who was Don King's son and had some pretty, uh, you know, atrocious experiences in his pro boxing career, you know, he was, he was worried about the atmosphere. It was a dangerous atmosphere uh, going into these underground matches, obviously where you have weapons and organized criminals and, and things, of, and, you know, bikers and things of this nature. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, there was a basic code in place an honor system. And, and he did say, you know, the, the blood was red, the cash was green. I mean, I always got paid on time. Yeah. I mean, honestly, a, a, the matches would vary. Uh, in terms of prize money, uh, I'd say an average that I heard over and over was around $10,000. Now, Bobby Gunn doesn't have $10,000 in his pocket uh, doing asphalt work. But what he would do right. is a couple of things. A lot of times he would be staked or backed by the Irish mob and they would have a place in Hell's Kitchen in New York. Uh, you go through this Irish bar, and, you know, down a back door, down some stairs, and there's a there's a fight uh, circuit there. And, you know, they they would stake money. 
uh, behind him. He would also gather money uh, from friends and family. Himself. Yeah, and it was a base. It was just a very basic proposition, and he would put in his own yeah. cash. But you bet on me, I'll double your money. That's really it. And he always came through. Right. It's like you want your money, then you bet on me, bro. I'm gonna do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the the most money he ever uh, won collectively in a in a bare knuckle match was in a, a Russian mob. Uh, fight in Sheepshead Bay in outer Brooklyn. And that was a $50,000 purse. That was 50. How long did that take? It was a long time. So in that fight, again, he told me he was uh, training at Ike and Randy's gym in, in Patterson, New Jersey. Said a couple of gentlemen from the Russian mob, uh, you know, left a, a message. They arranged to meet at a nearby Starbucks. Uh, <laughs> he met with them. They explained the terms, uh, the Russian Mob was looking to have an event. Uh, pro box combat sports are, are very popular in Russia in general. Uh, oh, yeah. And they even have their own disciplines. Uh, again, Bobby had definitely had a reputation at this point uh, up and down the eastern seaboard, uh, particularly in, in New York City uh, and across the country. And they basically said, hey, we're, we want to bring in somebody for you to fight. Uh, it, you'll be the main card on on this evening's entertainment, and Bobby agreed. And he went there, and he had a little bit of a crew, and they had put together some cash, and it was a big purse. Uh, ultimately, uh, you know, I think they put in twenty five total, um, and it was a long fight. I mean, the the guy they brought in from Russia could not speak English. Uh, it was a slightly different. I mean, the rules of bare knuckle boxing are simple, and you can now see it. The guys I was trailing, Bobby. And David Feldman. Uh, Feldman has literally created the Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship, uh, which has events. You can look them up online. Right you now. can watch them on pay-per-view. Mm -hmm. uh, there's going to mm -hmm. be a big one, Knuckle Mania, in Los Angeles yeah. in April. I will be there. Uh, it's it's become a $312 million sport now, and it's growing. Uh, these guys were doing this underground at that time. But the rules are simple. It's stand-up boxing. You know, It's just standing up, hitting each other. Just no gloves, obviously. So it's not it's not grappling. It's not getting you down on the floor. Um, you know, it's not also really these 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 bouts would sometimes go rough and tumble, which is means all rules are off. I'm going to gouge your eye. Uh, I'm going to try to bro. to beat, beat, <laughs> uh, bite your nose off. Uh, but those are that's that's that's, that's, un, that's unusual, um, and that's really either happens out of a desperation. Uh, by one fighter and then everyone understands okay this has gone south and let's see what happens or if it's like that from the beginning the money's usually bigger um but that that's a rarity so it, most of these matches are, are governed by basic boxing rules no hitting below the belt etc it's just it's just uh um, right with um no gloves uh but bobby gunn went in with this understanding it would be that kind of a fight but this guy was doing a slightly different variation of uh, you know Russian bare knuckle fighting and, and started again kind of doing more grappling crazy rules. Uh, Bobby just remembers him as being very hairy. Uh, Bobby says they walked in and it was people in evening wear and it was a nice dinner and event. And then there was a space cleared out in this mansion in outer Brooklyn uh, for these guys to in a makeshift ring go at each other. Bobby put him down multiple times, and uh, you know it was a fairly long fight by bare knuckle. Standards usually these things just last a couple minutes tops, uh, oh. because again, if you don't have a glove on, you know, glove is boxing's a war of attrition, right? Because it's it's these blunt, broad impacts that you're you're uh, hitting someone else with, and you're wearing them down. Obviously, there's a technical aspect as well. Bare knuckle boxing. I mean, if you don't have a glove on, you don't want to break your hand, so you're right. You're automatically pulling your punch to a certain extent. Now, the skin on skin, first off, the first time I ever saw one of these, it's the noise you remember. It's like this wet slap. It's 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 a very different sound, and it really does grab oh, your attention. Dude. But also, skin on skin contact's just bloodier. Um, now, the it, it looks bad, but the flip side of that is because you are pulling your own punch and you're hitting someone with less force so you don't break your hand, it actually reduces the impact uh, mm -hmm. and, and studies have shown this so far reduces, uh, you know, resulting concussions and CTE levels uh, because you just don't want to hit somebody as hard uh, so you don't break your hand. A great analogy is the sport of rugby versus the sport of NFL football. 
NFL football, we can all watch it on a Sunday afternoon with our kids. It looks really sanitized. These guys are doing massive, massive uh, damage to each other, but you don't see it. Rugby, uh, it's a pretty violent sport to watch. But again, in the long term, they're getting hit, hit with much less force. So when Bobby would go into these, he had decades of experience in the pro boxing ring, had a, had a real set of, of skills that most guys did not have. Uh, but he also really knew from years of bare knuckle fighting how to quickly take someone down. And a lot of those are body shots, organ shots, hit someone in the liver, go for the kidney. So he could like with his small hand, as opposed to a much bigger boxing glove, really kind of surgically strike and know where to hit you yeah, yeah. on your internals. And it just drops guys, you know, I mean, what he, his, his strategy would usually be to do a little bit of cuts up top, get some blood in their eyes. That typically takes the fight out of a person, gets them a bit disoriented and then drop sure. and then drop them pretty quickly with a devastating, very technical, very precise body shot. Bobby was doing that in this Russian fight at this mobster's uh, mansion in outer Brooklyn. Um, And the guy was basically unconscious. There was one young gangster in the crowd who kept yelling at the fighter. Maybe he had some money on the guy to get back up. Uh, Bobby said he was done. uh, And the kid pulled a gun, his, his gun says and um you know basically put it to bobby's head and you know everybody kind of freaked out obviously and there was some older gentleman who was running the organization there uh, kind of the don of the russian mob they looked to him he said no he fought a good fight give this man his money bobby got 50 grand in a brown paper bag yeah. and drove the hell out of there so. <laughs> peace oh bro but still i mean wow yeah, I mean, look, he's got in in the book. I, it's just crazy. I recount so many stories. Yeah, I mean, Bobby's life is like any, unlike any life you will ever come across. Um, you know, he was born in 1970 uh, to Irish travelers. If you've seen the film Snatch, the Guy Ritchie film, uh, uh, yes, Brad Brad Pitt's character is is an Irish traveler. Uh, so yes. these are basically itinerant workers, as the name would imply. Uh, Far and away. Yeah, I hate to bring that up, but yeah. I don't like your hat, Shannon. Yeah. And I don't like you. Yeah, you know, yeah. Come on, man. I mean, yeah. Tell me you like my hat. <laughs> you know, it's like exactly. <laughs> don't like your hat, and I don't like you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's not his sister, you know. But I mean, that whole that movie, Far and Away, was Irish travelers coming into America, picking out a job that they could get. They just wanted a job. They just wanted to work. And they're like, all right, well, let's fight then. Uh, bare knuckle fight. And I'm sitting in the position of the old school style stance. You know, it's like uh, he just had it in his nature. This Bobby Bobby Gunn is like, let's go. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. Um, and before we get into that, you, you bring up a point talking about far and away uh, with Irish immigrants in the 19th century. Um, Look, in the United States in the 1800s, bare knuckle boxing was the most popular sport in the country alongside horse racing and baseball. Uh, I did not I did not know any of this until I started doing research for the book. And we uh, include the history of this in the book. But it's fascinating. I mean, you know, it was always a means for immigrants coming to the country uh, to, you know, make money. It's obviously you don't do this unless you're you need cash pretty desperately. Uh, but also to uh, move themselves up in society. Um, I recount a story, uh, the Martin Scorsese film, Gangs of New York, right. uh, Daniel Day-Lewis's character, Bill the Butcher, based, the Butcher. based on a real-life uh, immigrant uh, who was also a champion, bare-knuckle boxer. And he was able to parlay that into political clout um, and that, that fame in the ring. Uh, there was several instances. Uh, there was Tom Molyneux, who was an enslaved person, in Virginia, uh, who became renowned as a bare knuckle boxer on plantation bouts, made so much money, uh, his owner uh, freed him. Uh, he then made his way to New York and then to England, where he uh, fought uh, bare knuckle champions over there. Um, and so, you know, it was a sport that was always a means for people in the most desperate situations to pull themselves up. The most famous person, the LeBron of the 1800s was this guy, John L. Sullivan. And it is the classic image of a, you know, mustachioed 
shirtless, you know, uh, yeah. a brawny, muscly guy. Uh, and he was the son of a Irish plumber who uh, became renowned for his bare knuckle boxing skills, uh, traveled the country. You know, his breakfast was like eating a dozen raw oysters and drinking whiskey. <laughs> and, uh, he, he would travel town to town and it was like a game. You know, anybody who can beat me, come on up. And he, he took them all down. Uh, you know, went to the White House to visit Teddy Roosevelt, traveled in the, you know, Wild Bill Hickox West Show, Wild West Show. Um, so, you know, really was was a headliner. But but what's fascinating is even back then in his final fight in New Orleans, uh, bare knuckle boxing was starting to become more and more um, unseemly. Uh, and, you know, especially amid, uh, you know, Christian, Protestant like taboo. Yeah, taboo. And it was just seen as bloody. And gambling was always a central part of this. So in his final fight, uh, where he took on uh, an opponent uh, outside, it was a mysterious location. Uh, people took a train at the last minute out of New Orleans. They were dodging authorities. And it was this epic, epic, you know, 70 something round bout. Um, and he won. Jeez. And he won. And uh, his, his opponent, Jake Corain, Great, great grandson actually ended up heading up special operations forces uh, years later. Uh, it was a, a seal and um, just just fascinating history of these guys. But that's when the sport really went underground. Boxing again uh, rose up. Uh, it was not as bloody. That bo- you know, gambling was still happening, but just not so ostentatiously. Um, and the the you could ha- you could make more money as a promoter. Because bare knuckle was usually a, a, a shorter duration, except for some of these crazy bouts back then. Uh, so it became a more sanitized version. But what's face, fascinating about boxing in general is, you know, one boxing commissioner told me it's a billion dollar sport run like a five and dime store. There's no NFL. There's no MLB, NBA. It's run by these state uh, boxing commissions. So, you right. know, there still is a lot of independence and, um, you know, different rules um, throughout. And, uh, and that's when, uh, you know, bare knuckle really went underground and you just had to know to get the invite to go to one of these things. And that's where, where Bobby Gunn became a champion. You know, uh, speaking of, uh, snatch previously, you know, with the Brad Pitt character, uh, he seems to always kind of tailor himself towards that scrapper fighter, like with the movie fight club, you yep. know, it's like straight up, bare knuckle he's just taking a drag flexing his ribs <laughs> and just right back to punching each other you know what i'm saying it's like yeah so so the, yeah and, and again taking it back to snatch so those are irish travelers and that's what bobby gunn is so you always think of the irish travelers especially depicted in that film as being overseas in ireland uh, but there is a large faction it's as the numbers aren't exactly known here in the united states it's estimated to be about ten thousand. Uh, but these are irish travelers who live and work across the country. Uh, they tend to be located more heavily in certain areas, uh, in Mississippi, South Carolina, New Jersey, outside of Fort Worth, Texas, there's a large community. Um, but basically it's a community that's very tight knit. They even have their own language, uh, which Bobby would slip into quite often with other people, uh, can't. And the joke is you can't understand us, but it's called can't. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and they, they tend to revere two things which is uh, religion and fighting. I mean, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a close-knit community. Uh, they are raised. I, I met a, a priest uh, who caters to the community in Memphis, and he gave me a lot of insight for the book. And, you know, they're just raised in a, in a very religious, old-school religious way. Um, and, you know, Bobby, before every fight, would literally lie prostrate on the ground, uh, praying to God. Uh, you know, he didn't drink, uh, no tattoos, no cigarettes, nothing like that. Um, you know, but the other part was fighting. These were people who they would pull their children out of school, uh, usually around the middle school age because they did not want them to assimilate typically with broader culture. And the, the, it's in their culture. And this is what Bobby was raised doing to work as an itinerant tradesman. Uh, it was a derogatory term uh, that was used, but, you know, tinker. Uh, was it uh, referring to travelers and that's those were traveling people in Ireland uh you know selling little trinkets and and things town so, to town so if you tinker on something yeah and like do, doing like metal work. doing like metal work again it's a derogatory term for the community as so is gypsy 
Uh, but these were all terms that were referencing the traveling, oh, no the traveling communities. Um, they would do like metal smithing and things like that. Uh, and that's what they do today. It's, it's usually more of like asphalt coating and, and, you know, working on barns and literally going door to door and knocking. Uh, they do have a reputation uh, for taking advantage of people, uh, as I re- as I report in the book, uh, for, to based on my interviews and reporting, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it absolutely is warranted in in several cases, and you can see this online. But I do think it's overblown, and it's unfair how this entire community has, has been, uh, you know, given that broad paint paint stroke. Uh, yeah. Bobby Gunn's a very upstanding person in his business dealings that I've seen, and um, you know, has 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 done right, and a lot of I think they're they're unfairly. Um, maligned in that way, but it is it is itinerant work, and that's what he was raised doing. Uh, but they also gather in these groups and they fight. His father uh, was before there was WWE. He was known as Black Bart, and he would travel in these early wow. early wrestling communities as the heel. These guys would be in like some sh- you know van traveling yeah. uh, city to city. You know, like a touring band, dude, trying to get there, yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah, playing in your local high school gym. Uh, you yes. know, they would have razor blades and do the cuts, all that. We have a gig at the hair salon, guys. Yeah. <laughs> a gig's a gig, bro. <laughs> it's 150 bucks. Yeah. So it's- <laughs> bring my $5,000 amps and all my stuff to the show that I, <laughs> yes, because it's a gig, right? Just to show the craft, to be a part of the art, to just be able to like continue and put it out there, uh, you know, like a, like, like traveling theater in back in the day where they'd have wagons that rolled through town and they'd set up a theater and people come pay a penny or pence or whatever to sit down and watch with this theatrical. I mean, really just to give the craft. I love it. Yeah. I love it. it. And good job, Bobby Gunn. You know what I'm saying? Good job. Well, Bobby grew up in that. So his father, um, you know, stopped doing that when, when Bobby was born and took him on the road with him. He left school at third grade. Uh, it's just hard to go to school and it wasn't really taking if they were always in moving. your book. You talk about how, you know, uh, I'll give a little bit out there. It talks about how, you know, he was 11 and his dad's waking him up because he's already been boxing as a young man, like yep. training as a boxer. His dad's like, get up and go, uh, uh, pummel these guys out in the parking lot for me. Will you? Cause they don't think they can, they think they can beat up probably an 11 year old. Like, I got this kid that can kick your ass. They're like, yeah, bring him out here. He's like, okay, 50 bucks. Who knows? Yeah. You know, but. Bobby was already thrown into the ring by his dad. A hundred percent. So, so Bobby from birth was trained in pro boxing. Uh, his goal was to be an Olympic boxer, but simultaneously the dad uh, started training him in the art of bare knuckle boxing as a child. Uh, and this was a tough, tough kid. They were living in motor courts, you know, uh, when they weren't on the road going campground to campground, looking for work, they were living in motor courts, on Lundy Lane on the outskirts of Niagara Falls, which was a tough area, you know, uh, if you imagine a motor court with criminals, prostitutes, that whole thing. Bobby, at 11 years old, one night he was sleeping on their shag carpet floor. Uh, his father, it was not unusual for his father to go out drinking all night, then be up at five in the morning and going out to work. Uh, but the dad woke, woke him up in the middle of the night, just remembered his cigarette glowing in the dark. His mom was asleep on the motel bed and the, the dad said, get up, put your clothes on. I've got a guy out here. You got to beat him. Um, and Bobby, uh, you know, without questioning it, did it, uh, put on his T-shirt and jeans, walked outside. It was a grown man that uh, Robert Gunn had brought home from the bar. There was a crowd of people watching the guy's buddies, along with some prostitutes and various hangers on. And, the you know, the guy. You basically kind of looked at Gunn. I was like, what the fuck? This is a kid. And Gunn just took him out straight uh, to, to the face. The orbital. Yeah. Pop. And um, and then, you know, the guy started throwing some haymakers and he took him down pretty quickly. And, and his father pocketed $100. So this is something that he would repeatedly do, which is quick cash. You know, he'd be like, I, I all the guys, and I talked to his father about this. His father's still alive. I interviewed him multiple times for the book. Um, he's like, yeah, you know, I just, I, I would bring home ringers. I knew my son could take him out. Now this is obviously an abusive situation. I mean, this is, um, not a healthy one. And, you know, Bobby is interesting. I mean, cause his father trained him in these really brutal ways of fighting. In addition to bare knuckle, he taught him what's known as rough and tumble, which I mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. And that's, those are rules. If it's, a, it's just a dirty street fight, you know, how, how to really, 
use any means necessary to take another person down. And it's, it's, it's fairly horrific, um, uh, way to fight. But Bobby was trained this way. And his father will say it too. He's like, look, I know he was entering a tough world. I was just wanting to forge him as a weapon. And even, uh, Bobby Gunn, he'll be like, yeah, this sounds awful. Uh, but I understand my dad. Um, and that's, that's what he was raising me to do. Um, and that's, that was just his childhood. Yeah. He, He's not feeling any like, oh, I was overwhelmed. He's not saying dad didn't know that I couldn't do this. Absolutely not. Dad was just he was dad wasn't throwing him to the wolves. Yeah. <laughs> he he was like, Come to my son. Let me introduce you to my child that yeah. I got here and he's gonna kick your ass. I mean, look And you don't think so. It's, and you're like, Oh, you're drunk, old man. Your kid can't beat me. He's <laughs> like, Yeah, I am a drunk old man, aren't I? I don't know. I'm just assuming, right? Yeah, <laughs> just talking shit, you know. Yeah, no. You know, how would you get your? Yeah, how would you get a fight going? You know, you got to poke the bear. Oh yeah, like the dad would definitely be on the sideline talking massive shit. Like you, yeah. You know, my son could kick. Yeah, your my ass. son's gonna kick your ass. And like, you call that? Exactly. You call that a fight? I mean, that's something else. Gun recounts is his dad was just a world class. Like, shit I'll go talker. with my eleven year old right now. He'll kick <laughs> yeah. your ass right now. And, yeah. and the son's back there, like, oh, I gotta wake up. Yeah, Let me just... yeah. That was it. Exactly. Yeah. That was it. Exactly. So, I mean, honestly, all of those guys were in, in for a world of pain. And they, I love they it. They would never know what was going to hit them. You know, they're, yeah. they're coming in two in the morning, drunk, mm-hmm. just you know, whatever. I'll, I'll pop this kid, and, and this they have no idea that they're coming up against the Terminator and uh, gun. This eleven year old kid just takes them down. How big was he at eleven? Do you think? How tall? How tall is uh 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 Bobby? You know, he's uh, not huge. I mean, he's around you know five eleven now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he'll he'll. I mean, he's he's a jacked five eleven. I mean, he is thick mm-hmm. and muscular. But he will say back then, as he calls himself, "quote I was an opie looking motherfucker." I mean, he was like, I think sure, sure. I mean, he's a skinny kid. It probably helped him win. Yeah, he was a skinny eleven year old kid. You know, but but again, the father he was already <laughs> training around Canada. Uh, his his mother was Amer- American. His father was Canadian, so he has dual citizenship. Uh, but he was he was training uh, as a as a pro boxer at that young age and really knew his stuff. So he was a le- yeah. lethal weapon. But he was a skinny little kid, right? But he just knew. He just knew. He just picked it up. There's kids in my gym right now that I look at and I'm like, man, how come I wasn't like 13 focused yeah. on boxing? I wish I would have been. I was 45 when I got introduced to the gym lifestyle yeah. I was always into boxing and for years but i was like oh one day i'll get in the gym one day one day one day one day one day and then i took that step and i made it that day and now i don't know why i can't go without it absolutely i mean it's a it's a great way to focus uh your mind your body uh, oh. your discipline as a, as a young yes. as a young person and that's something i saw not only in, in gun's life fighting you know he had a just a hard upbringing uh, he was ostracized because his his father was from one clan of travelers, his mother from another. He was a, a bit of an outsider, never really welcomed by broader family and community, and lonely. Um, had a, just a really hard, hard itinerant background and, and upbringing. And he really focused on boxing and the gym and his trainers and the managers, and you know that was really his productive outlet, his creative outlet in his life. Um, and I think it really did save him. And it, it just, it's, it's just an integral part of who he is. Oh, gyms can save lives. hundred percent. No doubt. There's a coach in there that can just see something in that kid and just be like, Hey, come here. Yeah, a- absolutely. Do this. Let me see that out of you. A- and next thing you know, you're like, I have a purpose and, and it's the gym and the gym. And I'm, and I see kids cleaning up the gym after gym, you know, they're like, Hey, I'm just helping out. Just making sure things are taken care of, yep. helping the coach put stuff away. Cause he's holding mitts and he's teaching us all this stuff. He doesn't really have he doesn't want to have to vacuum or whatever. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, that, that's it. Exactly. <laughs> and it's, it's part of the training too, right? That's part of that discipline, getting kids that is correct. to help with cleanup and, and all of that. And and there's, you know, every gym I went to, you know, and gun would take literally a baseball bat to some of these. And he had, you know, people had tried to jack him in these, some of these neighborhoods and, you know, whether it was Philadelphia and you're going into a walk up and it's literally an apartment that has become a makeshift gym for the community because they don't have a gym. But they needed right. that space. Um, all of these places that there was a lot of crime, these were hard, hard areas. Again, Gunn had a baseball bat with him for a reason. I never saw any problem personally. Um, I always saw nothing but respect because these these gyms are, are community hubs in, in a lot of uh, neighborhoods. And they're a place where young people, all people, 
can can go and, and really focus and, and improve themselves. And that was universally respected. And I saw that respect among fighters. You know, people who aren't familiar with the fight world, they might be surprised to see it. But, you know, sure, when they're in the cage or the ring, they're, they're going to pummel each other. That's, that's what they're doing. Mm-hmm. But outside of that, you know, they're shaking hands, hugging each other. Again, Bobby and one other fighter told me it was crazy. He would tell me how to you know, do dirty moves when a, when a ref wasn't looking, uh, in the, in the boxing ring. And the next second, he'd be asking me if Jesus has saved my life or, is, you know, is he giving it to oh my, my gosh, heart? Yeah, right. So, you know, but that's, that's the dichotomy here. And that, that right. was what was really fascinating. And it, it really is a true community. It is. And, uh, when I was in England, uh, hosting for soft rep, uh, we did the SAS special air service, special operations versus Navy SEALs. Yep. And, uh, similar, there was a boxing event. And uh, we got to go to this gym called the Peacock Gym over in London. Literally, it just gave the sense of a home and a training because they had a grill and a kitchen yeah. and two ladies in the back saying, what would you like to eat? Huh? You want some eggs? What you want? You know, you want some bangers yeah. and some hash or what? Yeah. You know, and they're just feeding you there. You're working out there. It's like, they're like, well, let's not let the fighter go too far away from the gym. Yeah. And, and it, the military aspect is interesting. In, in the opening scene of my book, um, it's a fight and it's it's a long scene where we is uh, we see Bobby in an underground fight somewhere in the Northeast. I don't put city names uh, as requested, yeah, uh, but <laughs> it was it was in an auto body shop and he was fighting a former Marine. And this former Marine uh, had been introduced to bare knuckle boxing uh, while in training in California around san diego the cpa uh yeah yeah the cpa that's right yeah yeah okay okay, okay. i'm just i'm not trying to give away anything no sorry i love you (laughs) sorry i think you're great dude i think this is a great book by the way you should go check this out guys thank you but he he he, (laughs) he was at the time uh he was a a marine and in training and uh and got introduced to bare knuckle boxing uh through through his military friends and then uh did tours overseas left the military um, you know, had some PTSD issues, was homeless for a while, uh, got straight, uh, as you as you point out, became a, a, a CPA, uh, doing taxes, uh, became a father, um, you know, would like subscribe to CPA monthly. But he I love he, that. he missed he missed the camaraderie. <laughs> it was hard for him to transition from the military uh, brotherhood and fraternity in that world into civilian life. He, he would talk about just going to a Costco and seeing walls and walls of antiseptic stuff. And it, it just kind of weirded him out and people would thank him for their service, but they wouldn't really understand anything, what he had done. He was just really kind of um, adrift, uh, but he reconnected with a sense of fraternity in the bare knuckle community. So he was doing fighting, boxing, got asked if he wanted to join some bare knuckle fights. And, and he said, he just really liked the fr- fraternal aspect. So you have a, a, a father, a CPA, uh, who is taking on a bare knuckle match. He doesn't need the money, uh, but he was up against Bobby Gunn, and he just he just ended he he liked the brotherhood of it, which is something he had missed from the military, and that's the opening scene yeah. of the book. Yeah, I love it, and it talks about like you know uh, how he was trained to see, and everybody in the Marine has two jobs, right? I love that you say that. It's like, there's two jobs in the Marine Corps. I'm going to slip it out there. One is the job you're doing, and the other is to kill. Yep. And so you have a CPA, Marine Corps killer, who has to transition from that life cycle and go to a civilian life cycle, and he found his outlet with in the gym and with Bobby and throwing fists and, you know, you know, working out really... The workout is 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 ninety percent of the of the battle. The staying in shape, yeah. the cardio, the the eating, trying to eat right. I mean, you know how hard it is to try to eat a banana after I work out. <laughs> yeah, no, got to find it. At, I'm just saying. <laughs> at, and there are multiple other fighters uh, I, I discuss in the book who also had uh, experience in the military, and there there really was an overlap. You know, obviously it's a it's a familiarity with violence when necessary, Mm -hmm. but, but it's also, I think bigger than that. uh, What, what I saw was, was this brotherhood and this community and this discipline uh, that, that people, people liked and and wanted to hold on to even after their service. Yeah. I like someone in the gym saying, okay, here's what we're going to do. You're going to do one minute of planks 
and they're like, Radel, put your butt down. And I'm like, you are literally talking to me <laughs> while I'm in a plank. He's literally saying it to me. It's my butt that's in the air. You know what I'm saying? He's like, level out. That's, there's something about that, you know? And, uh, I just, I just love it. And I, and I love, I love your book. I love your personality. I, I love the fact that you've got, uh, so much background working in, um, uh, other, uh, you know, subscriptions like GQ or Rolling Stone, uh, probably Esquire and, yep. uh, men's journal. Uh, yep. I think you even wrote an article about our buddy Brandon, who is, uh, softrep.com, Brandon Webb, right? I did. What, what, where is that article? What is that? What, which article did you write about him? So I wrote a feature story profile of soft rep founder Brandon Webb for Men's Journal magazine. The story is called Same. Navy Seal Inc. Uh, and I went out to visit Brandon. I flew out from New York. I I had, um, was aware of soft rep. I liked the coverage y'all were doing. Uh, you know, I liked that it was run by veterans and, and inside intel and information on on things that were happening around the world. I thought it was a really smart approach and the news was fantastic. I met up with Brandon and went out to California where he would fly in the San Diego area, had a private hangar with some former SEALs uh, who had done well in the private sector. And they would fly these old decommissioned Yak-52 planes they'd gotten from the Russians. Uh, and and right. aerial dogfights. I mean, this is legit yep. uh, Top Gun training territory. In fact, I met through Brandon. He, the guy had a hangar uh, who was the original Top Gun instructor uh, nearby. So Brandon had this kick-ass hangar. These guys all did, where it was literally, if you watch Top Gun, uh, the latest one, at the end, they're kind of working on the plane. That's like what these things are. And it had a little shower, a little kitchenette, a little bed, and then just this giant open bay door looking out on the runway and skies and i went out with these guys and uh went flying they put me in the back uh, one guy was a southwest airlines pilot <laughs> off duty a couple of them had just come out of the top gun school there was brandon there were a couple other ex-navy seals uh and these guys were pulling g's you know i had no idea i'd just gotten off a plane uh from new york and went up with these guys um and doing Aerial dogfights. I mean, you know, really pulling serious G's. Like, yeah, like shooting the watch, dude. You're like, like, you know, banking and they're yeah, going like this. Just, and just, it's just like, you're just doing circles. Inverted, yeah. You know, oh, to total inverted. <laughs> uh, my balls were up in my throat yeah. somewhere. Uh, Relations. Oh, I hate that. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and it was just incredible. And, uh, you know, went up with Brandon. And then that night, um, it was really fun because these guys would, the sun would be setting and they would have a, you know, a little catered meal. They'd break out some, you know, whiskey and drinks and cigars. Yes. And then guys just trading these crazy ass war stories and bullshitting into the night. Um, and it was really fun. And so I, I, I got a peek at, at Brandon's life, his own in, incredible story. He has a uh, very interesting relationship with his father as well yeah. i know it's over threw off a boat yep yep has overcome a lot of <laughs> adversity and uh, you know a lot of different things and, and clearly done very well and uh, you know as a sniper instructor in the seals and then uh now uh with soft rep and his business ventures um and then yeah another time i met up with brandon in new york in the city where he would go work out and he i think he was kind of fucking with me he, he took me out with his uh a couple other buddies of his where they would do swimming and they would, they would yeah. swim and then get out and do push ups, swim, get out, do push ups. And he's like, yeah, why don't you guys, why don't you hang with us? I did hang with them. I was the last guy, but I didn't, I didn't quit. And I think, uh, we kind of bond, That's what's bonded up. over that. But yeah, Brandon, Brandon, so went. swim a lap and then do push ups or swim, swim lap or like back and forth. It got a little, this is at the NY club. Yeah, it's right? at the NY the, club. Yep. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, so yeah. it got, got a little hazy to be honest. And I, this is before <laughs> I went to work one morning at men's journal in Manhattan. Uh, but yeah, it's NY club right off of, uh, central park South. Um, yeah. you know, I don't know. It was a long ass pool is all I remember. And we were swimming and we were getting out and doing push ups. And then afterwards we hit the, uh, sauna and i think we even did the we did some weights after that just getting a taste of the uh daily regimen um but yeah it was it was fun i had a lot of fun hanging with brandon and uh it's it's, it's amazing what you guys are are still rolling with here and i love your show 
Yeah, thank you. He's he is great to hang with. Uh, you know, there's lots of stories traveling with him. He's a great dude, and again, I I love that he loves me to keep me doing this. It's such an <laughs> honor to, and I get to interview you and and all sorts of other rock stars that come through my life, and I get to soak up some of your valor, <laughs> and then I get this. <laughs> I've got so much valor from all sorts of different people in me right now. It's not even funny, my man. I can help you run the VA. <laughs> I can help you write a book about bare knuckle boxing now. Uh, what else? You want me to cook a grilled cheese? <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. And, 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 and again, I, I haven't grabbed a book so many times while I've talked to an author or the, my guest, your book, this cover, um, is, is it, is it black? Blackstone. Yeah, man. Yeah. Available on it. It really made a- Amazon anywhere. Uh, but it looks fantastic. Yes. Um, they did a really good job with the design. My, uh, agent, Shane Salerno and Ryan Coleman at Story Factory uh, were really instrumental in the look and feel Story as Factory. well. But it's, um, yeah, look, I mean, Bobby Gunn is a fascinating life from, you know, fighting grown men in parking lots at age 11 uh, to becoming a pro boxer, uh, then leaving pro boxing at 30, just disillusioned with it. Uh, his mother had died. He got married. He wanted a different life for 10 years. Uh, he just fought solely in the underground and became a champion in the illegal underground circuit of bare knuckle boxing. I've got all these stories across the country of him fighting at age 40. It just smells like CBGB's <laughs> for some reason. I don't know why. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, it's just that whole time frame. Yeah. And we've got there's there's great photos throughout. So I was with him for yes. years. I was taking pictures. Uh, I got amazing vintage photos from Gunn and, and other people as well that we included. Uh, but at age 40, he goes back to pro boxing and fights some real serious contenders. Thomas Adamack, Roy Jones Jr. Uh, bro, you know, so, Roy Jones. Yeah, bro. and Roy Jones was fascinating. So Roy Jones came up in Gulf Coast, Florida, and his dad was into uh, dog fighting. Yeah, there's, Look at his arms. That's, that's, that, I know you guys – watching may not be able to see the best of it go get this book that that dude is yoked man he is yeah. he was you know he was huge bro. he was huge i mean the guy he's just so tight yeah and uh you know <sighs> and he fought roy jones jr and all these guys were fascinated by his his 73 and 0 record in bare knuckle box he became a legend you can you 100%. you can youtube him there are songs about bobby gunn I um, mean, he's almost like this legendary ghost figure, especially before the internet, you know, when he was doing this stuff, it was just the whisper of this guy. And he would come into town like a gunslinger and take down the local tough, take the money and he disappear. Uh, but, you know, Roy Jones Jr. was fascinated with that. He, he had grown up with a, a father who fought dogs, dog fighting. And he knew the blood sport, the cock fighting. Uh, yeah, and, right. and he respected gun. A lot of these guys respected gun for his, his ability to fight bare knuckle and um it's just an incredible life story yeah i i i'm really happy to have had you on the show today it's been a really great time and you know i know i've had you for you know a good little while today and so i i think i'll just kind of leave it on this positive note and just say that you're always welcome back on the show um anytime you have something to say or want to talk about it you know if you want to talk about you know, the article of you writing about Tyson Fury, you know, or if you want to talk about all, all these different things, you guys can go out and find all sorts of articles that um, uh, Staten has written. Uh, just go take a look, type in his name. You'll find so many Rolling Stones, Men's Journal, Esquire, Stock, or uh, so many. Yeah. I've seen them. Bro. <laughs> Thank you so much. This has been so much fun. I love your show. Thank you for having me. It's been a real pleasure. You know, and from all of us here at Soft Rep uh, Mafia, softrep.com, you know, that's my hashtag right there, Soft Rep like Mafia. <laughs> you know, we say thanks for being on the show. Uh, thanks for being a friend of the program. And you're always welcome back anytime, Staten. So thanks again. And on behalf of Staten and his book, Bare Knuckle, the Bobby Gunn 73 and O Undefeated, A Dad, A Dream, A Fight Like You've Never Seen by Staten Bonner. I hope you get used to hearing your name all the time like that, sir. So thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much. I, I loved it. Well, thank you. And to my listener and viewer out there, again, go check out the merch. We really appreciate that. And check out our book club. And we're going to try to get that book right into there. And on behalf of Brandon Webb, <laughs> I'm going to say peace. You've been listening to Soft Rep Radio.